Good morning. Um, I'm Oya Rieger from Cornell University Library, and it's a great pleasure to co-present with my colleague from Columbia University Library, Robert Volvan. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to share with you the findings of a too cool study that uh, assessed the role of Portico and LUX in preserving uh, each institution's digital um, journals, e-journals. And before actually I start, I should decipher Too Cool. Um, Too Cool is a collaboration between Cornell University and uh, Columbia University Libraries. And the goal of this partnership is to join hands to provide content, expertise, and services. Uh, with the support of the Mellon Foundation and also a partnership with Ethica Research, during the last two years, uh, we have been investigating the prerequisites for such a deep partnership, including uh, legal, technical, governance, and IT issues. As you all know, uh, academic libraries have increasing dependence on born digital e-journals. And these are often commercially produced and licensed. Uh, as ARL annual statistics from 2010 indicates, uh, that there is a dramatic shift in material spending, expenditure spending. According to uh, the 2010 data, looking at six years, the last six years, uh, the E percent content doubled from 33 percent to 61 percent. And also, if you look at the expenditure in 2010, again, based on ARL 2010 statistics, um, ARL libraries are spending 6 to 70 percent of their budgets on e-materials. And in this slide here, actually, I have, a, um, I have a chart from Cornell University Library, black showing uh, overall journal titles and red indicating e-journals, just to show you the increase. This is very encouraging from access and discovery perspective because as we all know, our users are increasingly preferring accessing e-journals over print journals. However, if we look at it from preservation perspective, this really brings up a totally different perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, archiving responsibility for e-journals is distributed. If you think about it, we have research libraries, uh, we have publishers, societies, uh, of course, university and college administrators, and scholars. And scholars is an interesting one because um, according to uh, the uh, 2010 OCLC report called A Slice of Research Life, from users' perspective, there is an implicit assumption that today's e-journals will be available for tomorrow's researchers. And interestingly, none of the faculty surveyed uh, in this OCLC uh, report indicated any concerns about the future of uh, e-resources. And the other issue is that it's elusive. And actually, the cool, to too cool study on uh, LUX really very much is based on this concept of uh, being elusive. And we originally called this under the hood because the goal of the Too Cool study was uh, Columbia and Cornell being important stakeholders in e-journal preservation. We wanted to look at it to see how internally these two um, applications, these two preservation solutions were being used. And it really began more um, from Locke's perspective because the study was motivated by 13 research questions. And during this uh, presentation, Bob and I will only cover three key ones that I listed here. And actually, the uh, report is available on the Too Cool website that you are welcome to look at it to see um, how uh, you know, we came out in means of looking at this question from 13 different perspectives. We formed a small team. And as I said, initially, the focus was on locks because some of the questions were really more triggered uh, with our uh, assessment of LUX, but very quickly we realized that LUX and Portico were kind of went hand in hand, that we needed to look at them together. I also must really note that this study was seen as a high level investigation, almost like a landscape analysis, and that uh, the goal was to answer some key questions, but also to come up with a further research agenda for um, both institutions. <clears throat> 
Describing to you Lux and Portico is certainly behind, beyond the scope of this presentation. I'm happy to see that I have, we have Vicky Reich uh, from Lux and uh, Kate Wittenberg from Portico here with us. So if you have any questions about Lux and Portico, we will uh, turn uh, the questions over to them. But with Lux, uh, actually, library community can participate in two ways. Either they can have their private uh, Lux network. It could be institutional or organizational and they can um, archive web-based materials, uh, not only archive them, but they have perpetual access to 100% of the titles uh, preserved, or they can participate in the global LUX network, which is a web-based subscription service, and this also includes uh, post-cancellation access. From a technical perspective, actually, LOX and Portico are two different approaches. Uh, Portico ingests data files directly from publishers uh, and in their native format, normalizes them, and offers them as a standard archival format to, to manage over time. Whereas LOX uh, collects and preserves all content in its original format from publishers, and one important thing about um, Lux is that they include format metadata to be able to enable browsers to render content. Actually, as I said, one of the titles is Looking Under the Hood because uh, this study really came about our honest assessment that uh, at Cornell and Columbia, we lacked a deep understanding of Lux and Portico, what if it does for us. As a matter of fact, we had to bring together maybe 10 people to really pull together all the little pieces to understand how we are using it. And uh, basically, uh, it's, uh, LOX is terribly underutilized in both institutions. That I want to emphasize that LOX is an alliance and each stakeholder has a specific role. Uh, to build a collection, libraries need to be very active in selecting titles and that working with uh, LOX staff um, we need to go through uh, publishers to be able to uh, attain permission and also work with LOX staff to create plugins. And unless each party is performing their roles, uh, in the, similar to the case uh, in, at Columbia and Cornell, LOX, is really turn, LOX turns into a kind of passive dark archive. Uh, Cornell and Columbia, unfortunately, neither of the institutions uh, were during our assessment. Uh, contributing to this collection development process. And also, both institutions made a decision, and this was really de facto, not necessarily a calculated decision, uh, that uh, when uh, content is not available from LUX, uh, from, I'm sorry, from publishers, they would be using uh, content from LUX boxes to uh, uh, activate uh, content access from their library management, library management systems. This really brings me to the second set of if issues, which is operational aspects. So uh, if you think about both Portico and LUX, uh, one important operational issue for the libraries is that uh, we need to know this preservation status of e-journals recorded in our electronic resource management systems, and also if there is any discontinuity of service, a certain e-publication is discontinued, or there's an interruption, or there is cancellation, there needs to be a system in place, automated system in place, to uh, trigger action, or at least to alert. Uh, actually, at Cornell, uh, in 2008, we manually entered data, and as you can imagine, manually entering data is definitely not sustainable. Uh, the information is significantly out of date, in addition, uh, the information recorded was very high level. It didn't include it really information about the details of such as journal issues, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and actually, I want to give you a very quick uh, uh, example just to illustrate the importance of operational aspects, deepening understanding more than, you know, locks being a preservation strategy. In uh, November 2010, uh, Lux uh, Alliance members were informed that um, a publisher is, uh, or, or we were informed that um, 12 titles would be withdrawn from the, their current publishing platform. 
And uh, what we needed to do was, uh, you know, to take the, to put place uh, the plan, to place the plan so that these 12 titles would be ingested and be available from Portico, from um, Cornell and uh, Columbia boxes. But interestingly, when our staff uh, made an effort, first of all, we realized that uh, our boxes, caches were full, so we had to upgrade it. And even at Cornell, we ran into a Tr trouble with uh, outdated old storage disks, and thanks to locks, we, we got help from them. And even today, neither institution yet has a plan to replace uh, serving these 12 titles. Uh, and actually, this also really surfaced for us an important issue that we totally missed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, two cools made a de facto decision not to serve lost journals uh, from their locks boxes themselves expecting that this process will be so slow that uh, you know, we will make the arrangements to replace it and then make a manual connection from our ERM to our library management system. So there was this hope that it will, it will happen rare and very slowly that our kind of manual efforts would be satisfactory. However, we learned from uh, Vicky Reich that uh, such a strategy in a way violates the alliance's agreement with publishers. Uh, in other words, aligned members do not have legal right to move content out of the lock system that we had to rely on our own box, not treat it as a, a dark archive, and put in place the um, procedures to be able to serve content as uh, it gets lost. So actually, I'm going to turn it over to Bob, but just to summarize these two, the, the responses that we gathered for the two first two research questions. We found out that um, uh, our uh, use of locks at Cornell and Columbia was really through inertia. It was not by design. And one of the problems was that uh, preservation responsibility in general, digital preservation, but also e-journal preservation role was distributed, involving staff from IT, collections, uh, technical services, and it pretty much you know, fell through the cracks that no one was taking organizational leadership. Now I'm going to actually turn it over to Bob for an example. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be talking about the third question that Oya mentioned, which is really a, a study of the coverage uh, at the time we were doing this uh, of our e-journal collections through both LOX and Portico. Um, and I'd like to say I'm happy to take questions at any point during this. On the, fortunately, the blinding lights make it a little difficult to see people in the back, so you might need to wave your, your arm if you want to get my attention. Um, so this piece of the study has already gotten some attention. I've heard it referred to in, in various uh, meetings that I've been at, and it, when it's talked about, it tends to boil down to a statement something like this, that only 13% or 15%, depending on, on who's doing the talking and what they're looking at, of, of the e-journals at Cornell and Columbia are currently being preserved. Uh, that's a fairly technically accurate statement, um, fairly technically accurate, we'll get to the, that in a minute. Uh, and, and as a rallying cry or call for action, it's, it's no doubt entirely appropriate, uh, but it's also perhaps a bit misleading. And so what I want to do, spend some time doing is saying, what is, what's behind that 13%? What, what's really under the hood as we look at the details? So uh, we're going to spend some time looking at what we found and then thinking a bit about some ideas we've had about what should be done about it, not just by Columbia and Cornell, but by the much uh, larger community that's concerned with these matters. And I'm going to start with a few disclaimers to try to depress expectations right from the start, um, but also to, to see these things in an appropriate context. So we were not really doing an evaluation of LOX or Portico in this part. We were really looking at the facts of what's preserved, what, what the actual coverage is. Um, there are many evaluative factors that might come in, but we're not going to be talking about those directly, although we'll be happy to bring that up in discussion. Uh, it's also not a complete survey of, of what's going on in the area of e-journal preservation. And later in the presentation, we'll refer to a few other initiatives underway um, that there are other methods and other uh, programs going on besides LOX and Portico as well. Uh, it was also not a rigorous research study. We, we designed it for a particular purpose. It served that purpose. And at the end, we realized there are a lot of other things we'd like to tease out of the data, but there's a limit to what we can tease out of the data because of the way the study was done. So there's a real potential here for follow-up and a number of, of further studies. And as you look at numbers here, these are numbers that are about 8 to 
12 months, eight to 10 months old, depending on, on which numbers I'm talking about, things may have changed since then. I don't think they've changed much in aggregate. As I, as I look back at some of this now, just to prepare for this talk, uh, I don't see major change, uh, but any specific piece of information might be different now than it was back then. So what we set out to do was to, to look at the overlap between locks and portico. Uh, you know, how much is done by both, how much is unique to each one, and what would that mean for us? And we ended up uh, learning and, and teasing out a lot more. Um, first of all, the way we went about it, uh, we pulled data from our e-journals, from our catalogs, from our electronic resource management systems. Uh, we limited, for purposes of comparison, to those that had either an ISSN or an EISSN. At the volume we're talking about, we had to do basically mass standard number comparison rather than looking up individual titles. It wouldn't have been practical. We followed up on some of the things to verify that, and we'll see examples of that later on, of the limitations of standard number matching. But that reduced our population almost immediately by 50%, because 50% of the records for e-journals in our systems don't have these standard numbers. Um, we'll delve into that a little bit in a minute, too. <clears throat> However, that still left us with a pretty large population. Uh, we started with a somewhat over 45,000 titles from Cornell and somewhat over 55,000 from Columbia for matching. We both sent data to Portico to do the matching. Um, our results were so close, and as we looked at the overlap in content, um, we felt that we could look at one data set against locks and, and rely on that to a certain degree. So all of the, the numbers I'm going to be talking about are largely Cornell numbers, but the Columbia numbers are off by 3% in, in that range, not a, not a huge difference. Um, basically, here's what we found. About 4% of the titles that we were matching were uh, available through locks only. Uh, about 14.5% were available through Portico only. 7.5% roughly available in both although not necessarily exactly the same holdings preserved at that moment in the two systems. And again, we'll, we'll look at a couple of the implications of that. So if you add up those numbers, it comes to 26% uh, of the titles that we were using for matching were found in either locks or portico. How do we get to 13%? Well, remember, 50% of our titles weren't even selected for matching. Now, the, the reason we can divide the 26 by 2 and say 50% aren't there is very few of the titles that are in Locks or Portico actually lack those standard numbers. So almost all of the things that, ha that lack ISSNs and, and, uh, and EISSNs, it's unlikely that we're going to find them. And in fact, when we did sampling, we, we found virtually none of those. They have special characteristics that we'll come back to in a minute as to why we wouldn't expect to find them in, in Locks or Portico. Um, now, I, I think when most of us think of, of e-journals, we have a kind of uh, er e-journal, a, a platonic ideal of e-journals in mind, but serial publications is what we were really looking at. When we extracted records, it was anything that was a serial publication that had some digital format. And that has a lot of implications for what we found. It says a lot about the diversity of library collections and it raises a lot of questions about our expectations for preservation of this kind of digital content. Um, I mentioned again the limitation to standard numbers. It's also important when we start looking at, at the details of numbers that we were talk, matching titles here. We weren't um, investigating what uh, um, expenditures, you know, if we, if we looked at our financial investment in electronic journal content and tried to figure out what portion of that is preserved, we'd undoubtedly come up with a very different number. Um, impressionistically, the, the big expensive science e-journals are, are more likely to be preserved than the tiny, small, one-off journals that we don't spend money on. Um, but nevertheless, a $4,000 title that is preserved and a you know, free journal that's not preserved counted as one title in each case. Uh, we also weren't looking at the extent of the content that was being preserved. So that $4,000 title that has you know, masses of content um, would count the same as a journal that has one volume, whether it's preserved or not preserved. Doing that analysis on content would actually be rather difficult. Uh, the, the, the ways of measuring content and the structures and the metadata that support that are, are um, complex, to say the least, as anyone who works with serial data knows. Mm -hmm. uh, matching across th what, what amounts to three different systems, our bibliographic information, sometimes four different systems, and the way it's presented to the preservation um, 
you know, services uh, don't necessarily align. I, I chose one example that's not um, completely representative, but not atypical either. We looked at a number of specific examples that are, that are preserved in both systems, and very often the exact content being preserved at that particular moment is not identical. It's not wildly divergent because they started at similar times and they're, they're acquiring over a period of time. Um, but you'll see that, that it, I chose this example because it doesn't favor one or the other. They each have content that the other doesn't have. So it raises a, another question about the extent of redundancy that's important just to ensure that we've got everything of this. Um, so the diversity of serials. Uh, any good serials cataloger knows that they're, that they're complex and there are all these different varieties. And we found examples of all of these in the data we were looking at. Um, again, when, when, if, if I just say e-journal, the, the idea that pops to mind are the, the scholarly peer-reviewed journals um, that we've been subscribing to for years and now have gone largely e only on the Elsevier's and Springer's and Oxford's and Cambridge's and, and so forth. Um, but in our collections, at least the way we've defined our collections and presented them to our users, there are these masses of other types of publications. Um, trade publications and newsletters of various organizations, annual reports from, from a variety of, of kinds of institutions, um, historical newspapers are in there, masses of government documents and, and so forth. And then those things that have bedeviled people for years because they are um, you know, neither fish nor fowl, they behave, you know, light behaves as a wave and a particle depending on how you measure it, and, and <laughs> conference proceedings and monographs and series behave as books and behave as journals depending on what lens you're looking through. Um, we're also looking at all kinds of digital forms. Again, you know, the, the, the primary focus on our, our e-journals is on things that are currently published, um, that, that often are made available by the publisher, uh, but there's a variety of other things that we were looking at. So in the data we were seeing, we have back files from these same publishers. Sometimes it's simply a back file of what's still being published. Other times we have uh, journals that have ceased publication, and these are dead titles that still nevertheless have the the back files online. Uh, the same thing happens when it's not made available by the publisher but through an aggregator, something like ProQuest or EBSCO or any of dozens of others that act as distributors for publishers. Um, we were looking, as I say, at historical uh, uh, serials as well, serials that have been digitized from library collections either by the libraries themselves or by Google or some other um, boutique or mass digitization project. Uh, many of these also appearing in commercial collections uh, made available, say, from Gale, Cengage, things like 18th century collections online and other historical collections of, of content. And then a, a sort of miscellaneous trove of things that are being published on the web that behave in some ways like serials and, and have different characteristics uh, but fall into the, the bibliographic data that we were looking at. Um, whether these should all be, we, they definitely shouldn't all be looked at the same way, and, and we're going to offer some suggestions for how we might parse this out and separate them. Um, and the question of whether they should be all considered as part of the same problem is a good question, but we'll, we'll have to think about that a bit more. Um, by the time we mish mash all this together, you might wonder whether we have any kind of useful data at all about numbers about all of this. It's easy to kind of avoid the problem by saying, well, it's very complex and there's all these different things. So what we tried to do was to characterize things and, and put things into categories. And we came up with, I think it, it breaks down to 11 categories in the end. These are somewhat arbitrary. Um, you, you could see it different ways and make up different categories. What, what we found a bit reassuring is while we were doing this, um, the staff at Portico were looking at the same data and looking at the same issues and trying to come up with the same you know, analysis. And we found a very high overlap in the way we had characterized things. I, I, I think we had 11 categories and they had nine and they were all fit together. So, so we, uh, we have some confidence that these are a reasonable lens for looking at things. Um, they, they're really made up of, in, in three different ways, I think. One is, is just ease of analysis. It's, it's easier to analyze things in groups in certain ways than in other ways. Um, Second is, is how they're made available to us. Uh, the, the data told us how we were getting it, what, what collections it came in, what sources it came from, and that served as a, as a useful point of analysis. But maybe more to the point also from the standpoint of how we should think about them and what kinds of strategies we might use in trying to get them preserved, if that's important to us. 
Um, so there's an overlap among these categories. Any particular title you might fit into two categories, even three categories. There are freely accessible titles that are coming to us through aggregators. There are East Asian titles that are freely accessible that are coming to us through aggregators and so forth and so on. Uh, we made them mutually exclusive for purposes of these numbers because, it, again, it relates back to what we might want to say about them and how we might want to think about them. But once we actually delve into this in detail, we'll see another, I think, another way of breaking things down and, and having to parse them out a bit more when we get to the title level. I'm not going to talk about these in any detail now because I'll come back to them. Um, they are in the order of, of numbers, so we started working from the top and saying where are most of these clustering and then how does it break down as we get farther down the list. Um, and you can see quite a variety of different categories here. I'll come back and talk about many of these briefly in a couple of minutes. I do want to, um, to say a little bit, to just give a few examples. I think examples help to make things real rather than talking abstractly about things. And these are not chosen to be typical examples necessarily, but to convey the, the diversity of things within this and the reasons why you can't even take um, any, any one type of journal and characterize it and say the same things about all of the things in that category. So without, without going in detail and reading through these things, you can see, you get some sense of the, the variety within there, um, the, the extent of them, some are familiar, some of them far from familiar. If anyone knows what the, uh, the last title on this screen is and can tell me what it is, I <laughs> wouldn't mind hearing. Um, we will have people who know that within our libraries and can hopefully give us some advice on these collections and what's important. Um, I, must, I, I can't resist mentioning the third one here because I was particularly struck by it. At, at Columbia, we've been also doing a program to harvest and archive content from the web and focusing on human rights organizations. This would be a perfect candidate for that web archiving initiative, except that no longer exists on the web. It's gone. Um, it's now coming through an Eastview collection, and uh, so we have a different kind of preservation uh, involved and a different kind of problem. Um, a few more examples, uh, as I mentioned, these historical collections are not only the ones in the U.S., but also things being done in other parts of the world. Um, book series, I just gave this example because this, this series that uh, to us appears looks like a serial because it's got a serial record for developments in volcanology is actually all the individual volumes are present in the Science Direct ebook collections. Um, as an example of data errors, uh, one showed, that showed as not preserved is the title Music and Medicine. In fact, it's preserved in both locks and portico, but the ISSN that's in our data doesn't match the ISSNs that's in their data, so there's a certain amount of that as well. Um, but then in the, in the end, there are these things that you might expect to find, and uh, things where, where we're relying on a, a kind of broad statement that a certain publisher is archived with these, uh, and we found it's not entirely the case all the time. Um, or things that are uh, these mixed um, types of presentations, like conferences, that, that may or may not appear. These are all examples of things that were in the unmatched, not preserved data. So taking another look at these, these different categories in a little more detail and thinking about them, um, we've started having conversations among ourselves, with some of our colleagues, with people at both Locks and Portico about what makes sense here. And I, we'll probably get different views on this, so I, I take this as a, a, a semi-official too cool view. It's far from a too cool, official too cool view, but, but reflects some of our conversations. If we think about the, the largest group, the group that are available through aggregators, um, this group is probably among the most important for us and also among the most difficult. It's difficult because the, the aggregator, the, the distributor, the ProQuests and the EBSCOs are not the rights holders for this. They have, they've acquired a limited set of rights for making these available, but in most cases the publisher still retains all the, the large amount of rights. And the, the distributors, the aggregators, have not, in most cases, again I'm generalizing, um, acquire the rights to make them available to third parties as an archive. So if we want to, to preserve them, uh, it really involves a tripartite kind of discussion and arrangement. The libraries, in most cases, don't have direct business relationships with the publishers of these. They're relying on the distributors and the aggregators to make them available. So we don't have a license with the publisher for this content. 
Um, the aggregator has a license with the publisher, but it's limited. It's limited to their main purposes. So if we want to get this, this group dealt with, we're going to have to develop some new ways of going about the process in the business. I, I say they're important because what we're seeing, at least at Columbia, is for years we've taken it as a principle that we are going to keep print until we know there's a preservation strategy for the electronic. And that's starting to erode now. People are tired of collecting print. Uh, they don't see the need in many cases. People want the electronic. Um, we've been through this for years and years. We went through it from the sciences and social sciences. And so now the, the, the collecting print solely for the purpose of ensuring that there is going to be a preservation copy becomes less of a compelling need, especially as we start dealing with budget situations and economic prices as well. Uh, on the other hand, when we turn to the miscellaneous, freely accessible titles, it's a very different picture and a very mixed bag. Um, what we found here is that we have acquired these, and that's definitely in quotes for a reason, en masse for the most part. Um, these are not, th there are many that are hand-picked that we've said, here's a freely accessible title, we want to make it available, please catalog it. Uh, we would like to see that it's preserved. But the bulk of them are coming because someone has become aware of a title has um, amassed information about it, and in our case, Serial Solutions, we're both using as, as a supplier of data, uh, has put together these large collections of freely accessible titles that uh, we get bibliographic information on. So the, the value within these is quite different. Some of them we would we consider important, others not. We would not necessarily have collected them if we had to collect them individually and put the kind of selection and curation efforts into them. And so looking at them as a group is going to mean uh, either we need mass solutions or more likely we need individual decisions on them to put the effort in. Um, and a similar situation, but perhaps a bit different, applies when we get into these newsletters and trade publications that for most, many libraries, perhaps most libraries in the print world would have been treated as ephemeral. Uh, if we acquired them at all, we might have acquired them and put them out for current awareness and then most of us would have uh, dispensed with them. Uh, in many cases, we wouldn't have acquired them at all. They would have been seen as, as too specialized. The, the, the Lincolnshire Horse Breeders Bulletin, and I think that's, if it's not the actual title, it's a, a, you know, fairly representative of some of these, is not something most of us would have been acquiring. Um, they now come in, in large databases of this type of content, um, and they may not have the same value to preserve individually. There are probably not too many people on our faculty who are waiting for the new issue of the Lincolnshire Horse Breeders Bulletin or, or citing articles in there. But the ability to analyze this kind of material, especially when you get a whole mass of material around an industry and you can, you can really do research on it, is a different story. And so preservation of this material might become more valuable than it was when it was scattered among many libraries in print form, but raises different challenges of how. Uh, we separated East Asian material, by which we really mean Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, for different reasons. Uh, many of the issues technically and, and from a, um, a philosophical standpoint are not all that different. But the legal environment in those countries, the, the technical environment for acquiring this, the ways they are brought together by aggregators are different and probably require a different set of people looking at them and a different set of arrangements to deal with them. Um, I'm going to skip the participating publishers for a minute because that's, that's in some ways one of the most interesting factors in here. Um, I was at least surprised by the, the low numbers here for non-participating publishers, by which we mean publishers that are making their content available but are not yet, if you go to the list of publishers participating in LOCKS or the list in Portico, you won't find them. Um, we know they're there. That they're not, they were not the ones that any of us decided to go after first, although in the early days of LOCKS we, we certainly thought we would be looking at many of these kinds of titles. Um, they tend to be not large groups, uh, not the publishers who are publishing 100, 200 titles, but the ones who are publishing one or two or five. Um, and so you, you get into cost-benefit issues. The, the, many cases they are important. Uh, the individual titles are things that we are finding valuable, and in many cases we're still collecting them in print. Um, but the work to preserve them, you preserve one title for almost the amount of work you would get for preserving a large number because you're making the setup arrangements and, and, and maintaining a, a kind of um, difficult relationship over time. Many of them are not as well positioned technically to just contribute to this effort. 
With the government titles, and to some extent with the international agencies, it raises other questions of, of whose responsibility should it be. Uh, there are, in other countries, um, you know, national mandates to collect and preserve this material, so that may be where, the way it's being dealt with in some areas. Um, again, I'm not going to dwell on that point, but it raises different questions. It was also a bit surprising. Uh, I think we expected to see more data errors and more problems with the data. Um, often I, I've tended to fall back on that as the explanation for why things don't work because we'll find examples, that, the, the one I gave before, where something just, it's there but, but it just didn't match and so it's easy to say, well, you know, there's really a lot more that's done. But, but when we tried to, to look at this, we didn't find a whole lot. We found some, um, but not as much as we might have thought. So, so relying on cleaning up the data is not going to be the answer to most of our problems. Going back to the participating publishers, this was a bit of a surprise to, to us and, in fact, to, to others. Um, and it wasn't, for the most part, I gave an example of one that we would have expected to find that, that wasn't in one of the, the services. But what we found more often is a misunderstanding on our part of what it means to be a participating, quote, publisher. So I, I, I'll singer out Springer as an example, not because I'm mad at Springer or you know, they're doing bad things or anything like that, but it was, a, it was one of the case studies we looked at in some detail, where they're acting as a third party distributor for other publishers. And so mentally, we tend to say, uh, we have an agreement for Springer Link, Springer e-journals. Um, Springer has an agreement with Locks and with Portico. They're preserved. Um, but there are titles within that that they're really not the publisher, they're the aggregator. And so we, we need to have a better understanding of what that means, what, th what those titles are, how to sort them out and know what's actually being preserved. If you look at our, our licenses for these, they often will say that you know, there's an archiving uh, provision that says they're being archived, but not everything that is in the purchase part of the license is in the archive part of the license, and they're not really specific as to which are which. Um, also, the, there's material there that gets into the, the content that's not structured as journals. So we found content that is, uh, at least in the Portico case, is deposited, um, but it's not, it's sort of in a lump. It's not available as individual journals yet. And this, this relates to a lot of the conference publications as an example, where they're not structured and as a set of journal articles with separate issues and files and so forth. So the the, um, the ability to track and audit and, and know exactly what is, is there is, uh, still leaves something to be desired. So this leads us to, to what should come next. What should we do about all this? And uh, just a few thoughts that we might want to use to start conversation. Um, the, there are obviously a number of different strategies that might be applied. As I said before, locks and portico are very valuable and, and important to us, but not necessarily what we should rely on for everything. And already, if we looked at those historical titles, and in fact many of the titles that are in that 50% that don't have ISSNs, they're, they're really the older material that is already being dealt with in other ways. So there's a lot of material that's being deposited with Hathi Trust uh, and preserved in that way. And there's another session in one of the other rooms right now about Hathi Trust. Um, Portico has a different um, arrangement with certain publishers to deposit digital collections, the, these large collections from Gail and Adam Matthew and others, and um, the journal content is within that as well. So there, there may be other ways of addressing the preservation question. Um, for the free material, if, if, the, the eDepot program, um, it, which is really running from the uh, National Library in the Netherlands, has a commitment now to preserve the thousands of titles in the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ. Um, is that an appropriate preservation strategy for us? Is it true for all of those freely accessible journals? We, we haven't really decided yet, but it's one thing that we should be considering at least. Um, and then there are some of them that, that we will acquire through other means, such as web archiving, harvesting the journals off of the websites and, and acquiring them that way. Um, there are other discussions going on about the university's role in publishing and the library's role in publishing within the university. Uh, we were acquiring some journals and putting them into our institutional repository, either because we are harvesting our own website content and putting it into our institutional repository, or because we are the publisher, and so we're taking the archiving responsibility as well as the publishing responsibility for these materials. Now, those are probably not going to deal with huge masses of material, but as we try to, to say where our efforts should be directed, that might help. 
And then, as I said, some of this material is not really probably best preserved as journals, but as books and individual documents. So what do we want to do next? Um, it's several steps. Some we can take ourselves, and some we really need to, to have a lot of help with. Um, we, we ought to repeat this analysis. How much have things changed in a year? It would help to run the same kind of analysis again. Undoubtedly, there will be things that are preserved that weren't before. There will also be new titles that have appeared that, that may or may not be preserved. Um, we'd also like to extend it a bit and try to delve a bit more into some of those questions of what it means in terms of content and in terms of investment, uh, which will be quite a challenge. If anybody wants to take those up, I'd be, love to hear about it. Uh, Obviously, we need to work with other libraries. If anything, this is the purpose of this presentation here is a call to action to, to get people to, to pay attention, to realize that we can't be passive and we can't be complacent about what's there, and we do have to work on this and come up with answers. Uh, once we've done that, of course, we, we, as, as I've heard endlessly from, from Vox and Portico, we need to work with the publishers. The libraries have greater clout with publishers uh, if we want things to happen. It has to be said over and over, and we have to make this uh, a part of our uh, business terms with them. But we also need to work with our partners in the preservation area. So uh, you, you'll, I'll, I'll anticipate my last slide and say I w we want to give great thanks to the staff at both Lox and Portico, who were really helpful in this process, who really were concerned and interested in this and contributed a great deal. And we, we look forward to continuing to work with them. We've also been talking to what is now the Keepers Registry. Uh, it started as, and still is, the Peppers Group in the UK, uh, which is developing a registry of what's preserved in a variety of ways, of, not just through the, the two that we're talking about, but other means as well. Um, and so working with them to see how can we better manage this data. Uh, we need a better understanding of, of the international context and what's being done in other countries outside of the, the even the, the, the Peppers and, and uh, and U.S. environment. And as Oya said, we can't do this manually. We, we ran into limitations already. We need better ways of communicating this data back and forth. Uh, we don't want to have to look up a title in the Keeper's Registry every time we want to find out if something's preserved or not. We need to be able to move data from Portico into OCLC and to Serial Solutions and to the systems we're using to manage our, our resources so we can see where they fit. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Vicky. Vicky. Mostly I want to say thank you to both of you for doing a very simple thing, which is paying attention. So thank you very much, both of you. And I do look forward to working with you to solve the problem. With that, one, cap, one, one question. The content that libraries pay a lot of money for is the content that is at least risk of disappearing. It's also the easiest to preserve. It's the cheapest and the easiest to preserve. And most of it, honestly, is in Portico. The content that is hard to preserve and is at most risk of disappearing is the content from the publishers who have the one title. And as, you, as both of you have heard me say many times, but perhaps the room hasn't, in this day and age, the most interesting content, in my view, is the freely available humanities literature being published by people who have no clue that open access and free is a political statement, but are just doing the kind of publishing that we used to bring in as special collections. That is extraordinarily expensive to process. How, in your organization, are you going to balance the, we are spending billions of, I'm going to exaggerate, but millions of dollars for this, for this stuff that really is not going away and isn't, is always going to be available, let's take Science Direct, always going to be available from the Elsevier platform mm -hmm. since Elsevier, Elsevier had its origins, I think, back in the 1300s. Mm -hmm. They're not going anywhere versus this stuff that we used to collect by meeting the artist on the, on the street corner in Bulgaria, you know, mm -hmm. so... 
how, how are you going to manage those internal conversations? I think it's an excellent question, and I'm afraid uh, we don't have a comprehensive response. We can have another too cool study to answer that question. But at a very high level, uh, actually, this is again um, an example of too cool collaboration. Last year, we looked into um, web archiving, and especially with the leadership from Columbia University, because they have a uh, you know very nice research study looking at many many aspects of it. And we are both uh, working with the Internet Archive using their archive it. So it's just starting as a foundation, and I must say that Colombia is definitely ahead of us. But with, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, if you look at open access publications, as you said, that are disseminating as we speak, especially in social sciences and humanities, you know, one of the issues is building an infrastructure for them. And Columbia study really nice to illustrate that from metadata standards to the ingest procedures to reflecting them on the catalog to the interface to understanding what features from technical perspective are important from discovery and access to usability because we cannot be um, preserving every feature. I'm actually going to stop here and turn it over to you if you want to add more. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Just a couple of things. Uh, I think it's a really good question that I don't think we're going to have thoroughly answered for some time. Um, I spent the early part of my career as a serials cataloger, part of the time cataloging these mimeographed poetry journals that might come out with two issues, and you know whether anybody else had them is, is another question. And I, I'm trying to remember. You know, Cliff made a remark yesterday that that struck me as an analogy. It's always been the case that the things that take the most intensive staff resources are the cheapest ones. The, the things that are free are the most expensive in, in other ways. Um, so, so we've had this problem, this issue all along. I think we're going to see fewer libraries working in that sphere, and that makes the dependence even greater on those fewer libraries. Uh, I think we need to look at clusters around mm -hmm. subjects. Uh, so these, as, as you said, these yeah. become almost special collections. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need everybody doing a, a handful here and there with no organization, but if, if Columbia says we're going to put our stake in the ground around human rights and somebody else says we're going to do those poetry journals, uh, that might be a way of, of getting a little bit of progress in this regard. I just want to add one more thing quickly. Um, actually, Janet Gertz from Columbia University Library is uh, uh, here. Uh, and in a way, this study also was promoted, some of the discussions we had. And these discussions were about the fragmented nature of uh, digital preservation decisions at libraries. You know, we work with HathiTrust. We work with the Internet Archive. Uh, archive. We work with Portico. We work with Locks. We do internal things, such as archive our own institution repositories. But you know, the question you're asking really requires that we look at it comprehensively, holistically, to understand how the pieces fit together. Because otherwise, uh, you know, we are going to find ourselves five years from now just focusing and having blind folders and not noticing what's happening in other areas. Got so just to follow up to that, that I didn't expect an answer. You okay. gave the answer that was perfect, so, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to add that we do work very closely. LOX works very closely with the Internet Archive. And mm -hmm. um, as an example, last, last month there was a, one of the titles, I think, I don't know who selected it, back when we were doing humanities journals for mm -hmm. LOX, there was a title called Big Bridge, one of these freely available it's actually being preserved in locks. And there was a movement called 100,000 Poets for Change, which we decided should be preserved, which absolutely could not be collected any other way than through Archive It. Okay. So we went and got it from Archive It, and there's a nice, we couple, we couple closely. So there are a variety of ingest ways into locks, and so that can be distributed out for, for preservation if you wanted to. FYI. We're also thinking of doing the same thing for government documents. Rather than make arrangements with each of the agencies that aren't coming through GPO, which would be way too expensive, just going and getting it with Archivit and then putting it into a distributed preservation system. So just, just to let you know that. And thank question. you. Uh, Bruce Hederick with uh, JSTOR and Portico. Um, Fascinating stuff. It's, uh, it's really been amazing having these conversations internally based on the research that you guys have done. And uh, 
So again, thank you for that. Um, I want to make a point and then ask a question. Uh, obviously, we've got fairly small organizations here, LOX, Portico, Hottie, who are, um, have a fairly big footprint for, for as small as they are. Um, and there's only so much that these small organizations can sort of take on in, in chasing down the, you know, as Vicki rightly points out, the really most at risk things. Um, and we have to, you have to balance that with the fact that even in the construct of participating libraries in Portico and Locks, you're really only talking about maybe 1,400 libraries at most. If you think about the number of institutions who have a JSTOR collection, it's about 7,500, 7,600 institutions. And only a small percentage of those are actually participating in these, one of these digital initiatives or both of them. So we have that problem of, of, um, of getting people engaged in, in, this, in this issue. And as, as with the economic situation the way it is, obviously, uh, the principle gets overtaken by practicality. And so you have a lot of smaller organizations, you know, libraries, in, in which case probably never did a lot of preservation, are making decisions based on what the larger institutions mm -hmm. like Columbia and Cornell are actually doing. And I wonder, when you look at an analysis like this, do you actually start to think internally, because you're dealing with the economic practicalities of this, sure. that there are going to be certain types of content that deserves different levels of preservation. So scholarly journals may need this, but you know, other content may need something that isn't quite the gold standard or isn't quite that. And are you starting to think about those decisions in that way that, that um, the expense of preservation, there's, there's sort of a, a tiering that happens of the content that you have? Actually, yesterday um, I was talking with Vicky, and I again used the term. This was a somewhat of a high-level quantitative analysis. Now we need to qualify this. And Vicky said, "Can you tell me what you really mean?" I think your my answer to your question would be maybe kind of delving into that. Um, as you said, you know, not each journal has the same importance, and even whether you are looking at it from a commercial perspective or scholar perspective. And one of the next steps that we are considering is probably based on a case study uh, or, again, uh, probably, you know, small steps, taking small steps forward. We want to look at, kind of analyze the content in means of uh, their priority or what level preservation would be sufficient. Maybe it's okay to be a dark archive for certain journals. But for certain journals, you may need you know, much more instantaneous and robust methodologies. So we are not ambitious, but the next step is really what we call qualifying to be able to, again, based on a case study, to kind of bring that analytical approaches to almost uh, kind of be more nuanced, I think, some of the issues that you addressed. Again, it will be a case study, but that's one of the issues we are considering. I'd also say um, my, my hope is that different groups, people, individuals, organizations will step up to different parts of this. Uh, and the, we should be looking at this also through the lens, you know, there's not just an, a matter of what's important, what's not important, but how things are used and how they're likely to be useful sometime 50 years from now or, you know, set your, set whatever time you like. I, I mentioned the trade publications as an example where, where one strategy doesn't fit everything mm -hmm. and it's not just a matter of, of um, priority or, or importance, it's a matter of, of what is needed. Mm -hmm. There are some things that the really important thing is going to be able to track down a citation that somebody's used in their research. There are other things where that's really almost irrelevant or at least not the primary use case. Um, so I, I would like to see different approaches there. Uh, I, I'm branching off from the question a little bit just to revert to a comment on in Oya's beginning remarks. The, the fundamental problem here seems to me that nobody knows whose job this yeah. is. Um, you know, it, it's the job of the people who, th who think it's important and come up and, and say it's going to be my job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one reason it hasn't been dealt with is that it's not clearly a collection development you know, who, responsibility. It's of interest to collection development, mm -hmm. but it's not clearly that person's job or preservation is, has dealt with things that we preserve ourselves and, and in certain techniques so it doesn't fit there. So, so we've got to think, and that means it's going to be different 
parts of different organizations that come together to do this. It's not going to be uh, all the people from one existing community. Now, how we organize it is, is, is the question of, you know, I'm hoping to see people in these rooms like these yeah. coming up with those questions. I think we might be able to take one more question if there are any new questions. Uh, once upon a time, the National Science Foundation tried to make the uh, different departments within the organization mm -hmm. to provide support to access the research network as a way of uh, expanding, if you will, the uh, the need for and the pain for access to the network. What do you think would be the possibility of any of the, if you will, um, granting organizations, or perhaps organizations singular, um, to include preservation as a line item in the grants for the work that the scholars are doing. <laughs> The question, just to, to repeat for the, uh, the recording, is uh, you know, NSF has had different strategies in, in the past for, for um, ensuring, uh, I, I'll separate that. The question was really, what's the potential for granting agencies uh, to, to include this, uh, the preservation uh, as a line item within, um, within the budgets for that? Uh, and, and I think that there's, it's interesting to think, you know, there's, there's been a lot of attention given to, um, to that, not so much for published content, but for, you know, data sets mm -hmm. as, as a big factor mm -hmm. now, um, to, to making access available, uh, but not as much for the, the, the junction of those things, you know, the access to research is, is, is an important factor in the granting now. Preservation of data is an important factor in the granting now, but they haven't really come together on some of this. Some of this may be a, a matter of, again, how do you translate that responsibility? If, if your grant includes responsibility for the preservation of publications that arise from the grant, it's, it's one thing to imagine that happening through an institutional repository uh, deposit of that. It's another thing to, to translate that into what happens when it gets published somewhere else and the rights go carry along and you have to track mm -hmm. that through. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah, it is. And actually, just a very quick addition, you know, it's, it's this general ecology of scholarly communication and all the changes. You may be aware that there are two RFIs now from the White House, one with research data, the other one is uh, uh, scholarly journals. And they are within the context of open access, but you know, Cornell's, one of Cornell's perspectives in responding is um, relating open access to preservation through redundancy and kind of making the case from a commercial or uh, economic perspective because this is related to Compete America Act. But uh, yeah, that's definitely one of the issues too, that overall publishing ecology and how we are building redundancies. Thank you very much for coming and yeah.